Hey, check it out. Picked this baby up cheap from a collector last week. Can you believe he told me he was having trouble unloading it? He said he'd already sold it twice before in the last few years, but nobody kept it for more than a couple of weeks. I guess the other numbskulls who bought it just couldn't appreciate what they had. I, on the other hand, as a lifelong Star Trek fan with a particular affinity for the Next Generation era of the franchise, know value when I see it. Of course, it's not perfect. It's pre-owned, for one thing, and it's off-brand for another. The guy I bought it from had to make a few changes to the design to avoid the whole unauthorized use of intellectual property thing. So, if anybody asks, this isn't a holodeck. It's a holographic simulator, okay? The other thing is, it didn't come pre-loaded with any programs. I guess I can download some, but I haven't yet. So, for now, I'm somewhat limited in the environments I can, you know, recreate. It does have this cool feature where it can extrapolate a 3D simulation from 2D images, though. So, I uploaded one of my Trek Actually videos to it, and we'll check this out. Computer, run program, actually one. Huh? Pretty cool, right? Accurate down to the smallest detail, I assure you. It's like I'm really here. Which is perfect for what we're about to do, because it just so happens this Trek Actually video will be devoted to an exploration of the question, is the holodeck actually more trouble than it's worth? Personally, I think this one is pretty straightforward, but this topic won the poll, so I'm gonna do right by it. Only, I don't think I'll have much to say, because the holodeck, not to be confused with my functionally identical but legally distinct holographic simulator, is obviously pretty awesome. The holodeck is what you get when the writers of a sci-fi adventure series set in the far future aboard a starship capable of traveling thousands of times the speed of light in a galaxy densely populated with intelligent spacefaring species decide that concept is too limiting. What if the starship encountering all these other intelligent species as it flies at thousands of times the speed of light through the galaxy also had a magic room where characters could create totally convincing virtual reality simulations of anything or anyone they could imagine? Does that open up the premise enough, you think? The holodeck is officially introduced in the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, Encounter at Farpoint. A very similar technology called the Rec Room is shown aboard Captain Kirk's Enterprise in The Practical Joker, an episode of Star Trek the Animated Series, but that's the only time it's ever seen. In Encounter at Farpoint and the other early appearances of the holodeck, characters treat it like stunning, cutting-edge technology, not something that's been available on starships for a hundred years already. So let's do what the writers of subsequent live-action Star Trek shows have usually done and pretend the animated series didn't happen unless we need to refer to it for a super nerdy callback or something. The question that comes to my mind about the holodeck isn't, is it more trouble than it's worth, but how does anyone get any work done? The locations, objects, and people simulated by the holodeck are depicted as seeming utterly real to the flesh and blood people who interact with them. I know people have said that artificial intelligence will be humanity's final invention, but if we invent convincing, totally immersive virtual reality first, I think we might just stop there. Holodecks can create interior and exterior locations, they can simulate all kinds of weather and environments, they can bring fictional characters to fully interactive life, and they can even recreate real people. More than anything else we see in the next generation era of Star Trek, the holodeck is proof of just how far humanity has progressed. These must be disciplined, dedicated people, because not only are they not spending every waking moment living out their fantasies in the magical dream room, almost every time we see a character wanting to use the holodeck, there's one available. You mean there's not even a waiting list? Our species truly has evolved. The holodeck isn't without its flaws, of course, but many of those flaws are due to inconsistencies in how the technology is portrayed in the various shows. For example, it took the producers of Star Trek The Next Generation a couple of years to really nail down what the rules were as far as what happens to stuff created in the holodeck when it leaves the holodeck. In the early seasons, we see things like Wesley exiting the holodeck still soaking wet with holographic water, or Picard taking a holographic snowball in the face despite the fact that he is standing outside the holodeck at the time. 
or Data taking a sheet of paper outside the holodeck, walking down the corridor with it, and showing it to Geordi. In later seasons, this ability to take holographic objects out of the holodeck is retconned away. In the sixth season episode, Ship in a Bottle, Picard explains to the sentient hologram of Professor Moriarty that matter created on the holodeck ceases to exist once it leaves the holodeck, and demonstrates this by tossing a holographic book through the doorway into the corridor. The book instantly vanishes. Of course, if you can't abide inconsistencies like that, you can suppose that in the early seasons of TNG, the holodeck was able to use matter replication to create simple objects people were likely to interact with, like water or snow or pieces of paper. And because these objects were replicated rather than holographic, they could be taken outside the holodeck. And you can further suppose that after Picard ate that snowball, which was about halfway through the first season, he called engineering and was like, look, you need to change the settings or something so it only makes holographic stuff from now on, because I'm the captain of the Starship Enterprise, and I shouldn't have to worry about getting face washed when I step out of a goddamn elevator across from the holodeck. Since it was a low-priority task, it took engineering a little while to complete the modifications on all of the Enterprise's holodecks, which is why we still see the odd holodeck object able to be carried away intact. But by the time Moriarty shows up for the second time in Season 6, the problem has long since been taken care of, and what is created on the holodeck stays on the holodeck. There. That explains it. The cracks in the reality of the made-up TV show about aliens and future astronauts have been repaired, so you can relax now. Okay? Well, sorry this one was so short, but like I said, this one's kind of a no-brainer. I talked about how great the holodeck is, cracked a few jokes, ridiculed my fellow Trekkies. I think that'll just about do it. This concludes my presentation. Computer and program. Computer and program. Exit. Arch. Computer? Alexa? So, seems we have a bit of a situation. That's okay. These things happen. They happen on Star Trek from time to time. And when the holodeck went all screwy on Star Trek, the solution was usually to play the scenario of the program all the way to its conclusion. Then the program would end automatically and everything was fine. This program was created by scanning one of my Trek Actually videos. Since it's still running, that must mean I haven't completed this video yet. All I have to do is finish making this video, the computer will end the program, and I can get out of here. I think. No problem. I'll just keep talking about the holodeck. In fact, I just now thought of something I forgot to mention before. Kind of a counterpoint to the whole the holodeck is awesome case I presented. For all its good points, the holodeck, and, it seems, this distinguishably different but suspiciously similar holographic simulator, has a tendency to... malfunction. Now that I think about it, the holodeck has been going haywire since before it was even officially introduced. Remember that episode of the animated series I mentioned, The Practical Joker? In that show, the Enterprise passes through a mysterious energy field that causes its computer to start playing pranks on the crew. When Dr. McCoy, Sulu, and Uhura enter the rec room, the computer sets a pitfall trap for them in a forest simulation and later subjects them to some life-threatening winter weather. So in the very first appearance of something like a holodeck that wasn't even called a holodeck yet, it goes all screwy and tries to kill the people in it. Funny how, for the purposes of the fiction of this video, I never noticed that before. The first proper holodeck episode of a Star Trek series is in Season 1 of Star Trek The Next Generation. It's one of the better episodes from that very uneven first season. It even won a Peabody Award 
for exemplifying a new standard of quality for first-run syndication. Maybe the fact that it was so warmly received is what compelled the producers of Star Trek to treat it as the template for pretty much every other holodeck episode that followed. As I'm sure most of you already know, the episode I'm talking about is called The Big Goodbye. So the Enterprise is on its way to meet with this species called the Gerada. The Gerada are very picky about matters of protocol, and Picard has to greet them in their impossible-to-pronounce native language without flubbing a single syllable, or they'll be upset and won't want to make friends with the Federation, which would be bad for reasons. Picard has been practicing for hours, and Troy is like, you need a break. Go unwind on the holodeck for a while. So Picard goes to the holodeck, runs a program based on Dixon Hill, this 1940s pulp detective that he's a fan of, and he's really impressed. So after a brief staff meeting where the importance of nailing the greeting to the Gerada is re-emphasized, Picard gets dressed up in period costume and goes back into the program, this time accompanied by Data, a historian named Waylon who's just along to get shot so his imminent death can be a source of tension when everything goes wrong, and eventually Dr. Crusher. Everything's going fine, Picard and friends are enjoying the Dixon Hill program, when a long-range probe from the Gerada scans the Enterprise, which causes the ship's systems to go all screwy. Geordi soon figures out that the holodeck is locked. No one can get in or out. Meanwhile, Waylon is shot by a character from the program, and Picard and friends realize that the safety protocols have been disabled, which allows holographic bullets to be just as lethal as real ones. And Picard's like, I'll remember that, that might come in handy someday. <laughs> anyway, while Picard and company are stuck in the Dixon Hill program with Waylon bleeding to death, Geordi and Wesley are outside trying to repair the holodeck controls so they can get everybody out of there. Riker's starting to sweat because the Gerada are being all pissy wanting to know where Captain Picard is, so he says to Geordi and Wesley, just unplug it or something. Turn the holodeck off, we'll crowbar the doors open, problem solved. And Wesley's like, oh, that's a bad idea because if the program aborts instead of being shut down properly, everyone inside the holodeck, including the real people, could vanish. What? Lucky for me, Control-Alt-Delete didn't work. Meanwhile, in the holodeck, Leech, the guy who shot Waylon, comes back and he's got the Kingpin with him. And Kingpin is like, How long have you known about Matt Murdock's other life? And Picard is like, I think you're in the wrong program? Wesley and Geordi finally get the doors to work, and the Kingpin and Leech are like, Hey, let's go through the magic doors and become racketeers on the spaceship! So they walk outside the holodeck, and they disappear. And Kingpin is like, No, they can't do this to me. I'll have my final revenge. Daredevil's real name is Matt! Anyway, they get Waylon to sickbay before he bleeds out, Picard rushes to the bridge and nails the greeting to the Gerada, and then orders Data to immediately leave orbit and set course for another planet. So that's it? All Picard had to do was drop in for two minutes and say hi? No ceremonies, no negotiations, no diplomatic functions of any kind? These Gerada are awfully persnickety for a species we never see again. Plus, their long-range scan you know, broke the Enterprise. Are we sure these dickweeds are that important? Like I said, the big goodbye is the model for most of the holodeck episodes that followed. Characters enter holodeck expecting to have a good time, something malfunctions, holodeck tries to kill everybody. This formula is embellished a bit in the first holodeck-centered episode of TNG's second season, Elementary Dear Data, when we learn that, oh, by the way, the holodeck can also create conscious, sentient beings if you ask it to. That's totally okay and not loaded with horrifying moral implications. Since potentially lethal malfunctions happen so often when the holodeck is prominently featured in episodes, I guess it's reasonable to question whether the holodeck, as awesome as it is, is worth having aboard a starship, because it's only awesome when it's working properly. When it's not working properly, it's a threat to the safety of everyone on board. I can see how that might be somewhat of a liability. And while that is certainly a problem for characters living within the reality of the show, it's also a problem when viewed from the outside. Almost immediately, the holodeck became a hook on which writers could hang every off-model, self-indulgent idea they could imagine. 
I'm tired of writing a space western. I want to do a literal western. Holodeck. I'm tired of just referencing Shakespeare all the time. I want to make a mini-movie of a Shakespeare scene starring one of our characters. Holodeck. And it spread beyond TNG as well. I'm so goddamned bored with this pointless series that I think it would be more interesting to devote lengthy sequences of multiple episodes to just watching the captain act out a totally unrelated gothic novel. You got it, Ms. Taylor. Holodeck. We want to drive this entire franchise over a cliff by framing the series finale as taking place during deleted scenes from an episode of a completely different show. Gee, Mr. Berman and Mr. Braga, are you sure? Okay, then. Holodeck. So yeah, I guess I was wrong. The holodeck is a crutch for lazy writing, too tempting for even good writers to resist. And from an in-story perspective, why would you want to have a magic fantasy room on your spaceship if at any given moment it could turn into an inescapable murder box? I guess the holodeck is actually more trouble than it's worth after all. This concludes my presentation. Computer and program? God damn it. I've made the case for both sides. What else can I say about the holodeck? Either characters and writers use it for wish fulfillment, or it malfunctions and threatens the ship, and usually both of those things happen, one after the other. Hell, sometimes even when the holodeck does all right for one episode, it messes things up later. Like when Jordy creates a holographic Leah Brahms to help the Enterprise escape a booby trap, becomes infatuated with Dr. Brahms through the hologram, then meets the real Dr. Brahms in a later episode who is nothing like her hologram, who eventually discovers the hologram of herself, which makes Jordy look like a sad, lonely creep. Which, wait a second, that's it! In the Booby Trap episode, before he develops his pathetic crush on Hollow Brahms, Jordy goes to the holodeck not for recreation, but to use it as a tool to help him solve a problem. That's what I've been missing, because that's not the only time we see the holodeck used that way. In Identity Crisis, Jordy uses the holodeck to find the source of an unexplained shadow in a visual log. In the Rashomon episode, A Matter of Perspective, the holodeck is used to illustrate the testimony of various witnesses during a hearing about whether or not Commander Riker tried to sexually assault a woman and then murdered her husband by blowing up his space station to prevent him from reporting it. Remember that lighthearted romp through the stars? And in Schisms, members of the Enterprise crew use the holodeck to reconstruct their fragmented memories of a mysterious room to which they had all been abducted. Now that I think about it, the holodeck is shown to have other practical uses, too. The crews of various starships use it for training. On Voyager, Tuvok uses the holodeck to help him teach former Maquis members proper Starfleet procedures. On TNG, we see it being used as part of the bridge officer's test. There's Troy ordering Hollow Geordi to his death. God damn, real or holographic, that guy cannot catch a break on the holodeck, can he? And how can I neglect to mention Worf's calisthenics program? where he exercises and blows off steam by fighting Skeletor. Hey, maybe that's why Worf wears his hair like He-Man for most of the series, eh? And finally, since I talked about the times when the holodeck malfunctions and almost kills everybody, what about the admittedly fewer times when something goes wrong somewhere else and the holodeck is essential to saving the day? Like what happens in my favorite holodeck episode of any Trek series from Deep Space Nine's fourth season, Our Man Bashir. In this episode, Dr. Bashir and Garrick are in the middle of Bashir's James Bond fantasy when, outside the station, a runabout carrying almost the entire senior staff explodes. Eddington manages to beam everyone out just in time, but the explosion overloads the transporter, trapping the crew in the buffer and forcing the computer to save their patterns until they can be rematerialized. Eddington and Odo, the only other main character not either in the Hollow Suite or on the runabout, are forced to wipe the station's computer memory in order to store the neural information of the crew. And, with nowhere else to put them, the computer stores their physical patterns in the Hollow Suite's memory and incorporates their images in to Bashir's program. This is a great episode for a few reasons. Firstly, it allows the cast members who are on the blown up runabout to play their characters out of character as they assume various roles in Bashir's program. Avery Brooks given free reign to overact his ass off as an over-the-top supervillain is <laughs> amazing. And the episode allows the writers to play with two sets of tropes at the same time. 
they poke fun at James Bond-style spy movies, and they manage to acknowledge and subvert some of the tropes that by then had made Star Trek's holodeck episodes so predictable. The safety protocols are disabled again, of course, which makes the program very dangerous, but they can't just end the program because they're afraid they might lose the patterns of Cisco and the others who were in the runabout. But that is complicated by the presence of Garrick, a ruthless pragmatist who is totally willing to leave the Hollow Suite and risk killing the others if it means saving his own life. The loss of safety protocols allows Bashir to actually shoot Garrick at one point, preventing him from leaving the Hollow Suite and possibly saving the lives of his crewmates. Ultimately, Bashir, stalling for time as Eddington, Odo, and Rom scramble to modify the Defiance transporter to rematerialize the trapped crew members, saves the day by intentionally destroying the world in the program. Realizing that his goal is for everyone trapped in the holodeck to survive rather than to defeat the evil Dr. Noah, secret agent Bashir lets the bad guy win. Because who cares? It's just a fantasy. It's not the real thing. But sometimes a fantasy is all you need. Our man Bashir proves that the holodeck, or hollow suite if you want to get technical, can be useful in unexpected ways. If the hollow suite hadn't been there, Cisco, Kira, Dax, O'Brien, and Worf would have died. The episode also demonstrates that holodeck shows don't have to be wrote by the numbers retreads of the same old formula. In the hands of motivated, creative writers, the holodeck can be utilized in ways that are clever, imaginative, even moving. As is the case in another great DS9 episode, It's Only a Paper Moon, where Nog takes refuge in Vic Fontaine's Hollow Suite program after losing his leg in battle. And let's not forget about one of the best recurring characters in the entire franchise, Reg Barkley. I won't say much about him here, because I did a whole video about him already, but his first two episodes of TNG, Hollow Pursuits and The Nth Degree, are among the best holodeck shows ever done. And two more examples of how the holodeck can be used to develop character and tell complex and emotionally satisfying stories. So you know what? I'm changing my conclusion. Back to my original conclusion. Yes, the holodeck sometimes malfunctions and turns into a murder box, but there are many technologies that can be dangerous if they aren't working properly or are being intentionally misused, but are still beneficial to our modern lives. And the potential uses of the holodeck, both practically and recreationally, are virtually unlimited. I'd say the good outweighs the bad. No, the holodeck is not actually more trouble than it's worth. It's a nice thing to have around. When you're not trapped inside of it. What do you think? As for me, I think I'm done here. Computer? Shut this bloody thing off. That's better. Now the only problem is what to do with this thing. I suppose I could resell it, but <laughs> after this video goes up, there's no way I'm not losing money on that deal. Maybe I can download a program for it that'll let me get some use out of it. Wow, there are so many holodeck programs on my abandonware. Oh, Toolshed. Nah, I don't have any tools. Here we go. Walk-in closet. That's the one. I'll have to tell my wife not to turn it off, just in case that would make our clothes disappear, but other than that, yeah, I think this will work. I always wanted a big-ass closet. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go see if I can fix our washer and dryer. They've been acting kind of funny ever since that mysterious energy cloud passed through our laundry room. See you next time. Hey folks, well, there you go. That's the Holodeck episode, the first Trek Actually video of 2019, and also the first Trek Actually video with the topic chosen by my Patreon patrons. Now I'm gonna let you know what my patrons have selected as the topic for the next Trek Actually video in just a minute, but first I wanna give a shout out to these fine folks, my newest $5 per month or more Patreon patrons. 
Antonio Ackridge, thank you, Antonio. Chip Bush, thank you, Chip. Austin Cummins, thank you, Austin. Major Tom, thank you, Major Tom. Eric Shepard, thank you, Eric. Dave Edwards, thank you, Dave. Kiara Leach, thank you, Kiara. Bo Breeden, thank you, Bo. Larry Yellingman, thank you, Larry. Sam, thank you, Sam. James Dodd, thank you, James. Stevie Twin, thank you, Stevie. Marla Irwin, thank you, Marla. Daniel Zafer Joyce, thank you, Daniel. Caroline Clark, thank you, Caroline. And Sabri Zane, thank you, Sabri. Thanks to all of you for being patrons. If you want to get yourself a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video, just become a patron at a level of $5 per month or higher, and I'll shout your name out at the end of the next proper Trek Actually video that I make after you start your pledge. Um, it's just one of the little rewards that I try to give to show my appreciation for people who are my Patreon patrons and go a little bit above and beyond the call of duty. I also want to remind you, if you dig the Trek Actually videos and you like sort of funny Star Trek themed stuff, if you're not listening to the Ensign's Log podcast, do yourself a favor and listen to the Ensign's Log podcast. It is an improv comedy podcast starring the brilliant, funny, hilarious Jason Harding and myself. We play low-ranking ensigns serving aboard a certain famous Starfleet vessel embarking on a certain legendary five-year mission. It's been a ton of fun. Every one of our episodes corresponds with an episode of the uh, original Star Trek, and we are almost to the end of the first season. It's a big deal for us. We're getting to the end of our first season of the show as well. So if you haven't checked out the Ensign's Log yet, check it out. You can listen to all of the episodes at Let Me Listen podcasts.com or you can subscribe via RSS through your favorite podcast app. Links are in the description of this video. Now, as I said, from now on, the topics of Trek Actually videos will be selected via a poll of my Patreon patrons. You can be a patron at any level, from a dollar a month on up to however much you think I'm worth and however much you can afford, and you can vote in the polls to choose the Trek Actually topics. If you want to vote for the March Trek Actually topic, the poll for that uh, episode will be live a few hours after this video goes up, so check my Patreon page, patreon.com slash steveshives, for when the next poll goes up. But for now, the poll for February has closed, and I can tell you that the topic of next month's proper Trek Actually video will be why Guinan should actually have Counselor Troy's job. I was kind of hoping that one would win at least eventually, if not this next month, then at some point, because that's going to be a fun topic to write about and to do a video about. So that's February's Trek Actually video, why Guinan should actually have Counselor Troy's job. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to vote in the poll for March's video and for subsequent videos after that. Enjoy the Guinan video when it gets here next month. I hope you enjoyed the holodeck video. Thank you all so much for watching and for your support in whatever form it takes. And I'll see you next time.